more globalized world in some ways reduces risks. You have more diversification. Right. On the other hand, it might increase more systemic risk. Unbalanced, do you think the increased pace of globalization has been more or less risky? Globalization is generally good for growth. Mm -hmm. um, and globalization has probably helped millions, if not billions, out of poverty. It's a very uh, good evolution. However, globalization doesn't work for all necessarily. Um, some, uh, in particular, in combination with technological change, uh, globalization has displaced some. And so uh, political frameworks and economic frameworks have to make sure that the benefits are shared in an inclusive manner. Mm -hmm. Um, that the benefits of globalization are shared. Uh, if, if they are not, this can give rise to political forces which can undermine globalization. This is what uh, the managing director of the IMF, Christine Lagarde, uh, has called for a new multilateralism mm -hmm. that is taking into account that the, sh that the benefits of globalization have to be shared broadly. So is this also leading, I mean, a, it also just, you know, financial flows also operate differently. Right. Um, so, I mean, there's been some people at the fund have been talking about capital controls, which would have been an anathema, uh, you know, yeah. 20 years ago. Absolutely. Is it also causing you to rethink things like this? Yeah, there has been uh, a lot of rethinking about capital flow measures at the fund. Uh, in general, capital flows are very important for economic development. Mm -hmm. Uh, recipient countries of capital flows can greatly benefit in terms of increasing investment and increasing growth rates by receiving capital flows. But capital flows can be volatile and uh, capital flow surges can be associated with a buildup of risk in the mm -hmm. country. So oftentimes we see that an inflow surge goes hand in hand with a surge in credit to GDP which can increase forward-looking risks. Um, in general, we advise our membership to have the proper macroprudential frameworks and macroeconomic policies in place in order to deal with the risks associated with capital flows. But not every country has the full set of macroprudential and macroeconomic tools in place. And so capital flow instruments can be a complementary policy tool to mitigate uh, the risks that are arising from capital flows. Uh, having said that, capital flow instruments should not be used as a substitute for sound macroeconomic or macroprudential policies. Mm -hmm. So in that vein, um, you're talking a lot about how we need better coordination with both uh, monetary and financial regulation. Mm -hmm. um, but we're also seeing a lot more rising nationalism where people want to put their own needs first, which could lead to some coordination failures. How do you get around that? Yeah, I would say that uh, uh, from the regulatory point of view, uh, over the past three or four decades, uh, a working relationship has emerged among uh, regulators where they come together uh, in Basel in bodies such as the Financial Stability Board, the Basel Committee, or IASCO for uh, the bank supervisor, uh, for the market regulators, and they uh, discuss what appropriate minimum requirements are either in terms of capital or in mm -hmm. terms of safety and soundness uh, requirements and um, there's a, a process where these regulators are, are sorting out what uh, a, a sensible set of minimum standards are those minimum standards are then implemented in terms of laws, rules, and regulations in each country. And there's some variance around the minimum standards. Some are a little bit tighter, some are a little bit looser than what is recommended by Basel. But in general, that has worked very well in terms of coordinating prudential policy. And the fund is doing financial sector assessments mm -hmm. where we look at how these uh, common standards are implemented. And in general, we do find that, say, since the global financial crisis, a lot of these common prudential standards have been phased in around the world. In terms of monetary policy, of course, uh, 
the, the, the monetary policy objectives for pretty much every central bank in the world is a domestic objective. So it is about achieving inflation and uh, real uh, activity goals for uh, the, the country. Um, having said that, central bank governors often come together and discuss how they view the global outlook, how they view developments in financial markets and in the economy, and that helps coordinate uh, at least uh, the baseline assessment of what's happening in the world. Huh. So you were talking earlier about volatility and yeah. how we can expect to see more volatility in markets between ETFs and high-frequency trading. So why do you think it is up until last year we were seeing less volatility than normal? Yeah, so uh, 2017 was a year with unusually low volatility. Mm -hmm. Right, market volatility was extremely low, but also when you look at uh, economic news, there was actually primarily good news, and there wasn't as much risk. If anything, there was upside risk in mm -hmm. economic news. So market volatility was very, very compressed, and markets in general rallied. So when you look at the breadth of risky asset markets, most risky asset markets had positive res returns in 2017. Mm -hmm. That's historically very unusual. 2018 saw a reversal of that, and most risky asset markets around the world had negative returns. Mm -hmm. And that in of, of itself is also very unusual to see very, very broad negative returns across all risky assets. And associated with that were two spikes in volatility. First, in February, there was a sharp spike in global volatility triggered by equity market developments. And then later in the year, there was a sharp spike in volatility associated with worries about global growth. Uh, and in between those two spikes in, that were you know, triggered in advanced economies, there was also a sell-off of emerging markets. So we really saw quite, ba quite a bit of bad news in markets in 2018 followed by very, very good news in markets in 2017. And I think it's sort of interesting uh, to, uh, to speculate that these spikes in volatility and these sharp swings in financial conditions might become more frequent going forward uh, as the market structure is changing, the role of intermediaries, the dealers, the traditional dealers is changing, there's more electronic trading, uh, regulations have changed. All of that is changing uh, uh, the endogenous uh, um, volatility or volatility. So volatility and financial conditions might have become more volatile. There might be more spikes. So we'll see more of 2018. Or I guess you could argue that if you have a larger window <coughs> to measure your volatility, maybe it doesn't look so stable. Yeah, so... Um, of course, we also at a, at a particular moment in the cycle, in the credit cycle, where market participants are trying to figure out whether there's, there's a turning point, mm -hmm. right? So there's a lot of worry that there might be a recession coming or that the credit cycle is turning uh, after many, many years of a boom. And in these times of uncertainty, coupled not only with the economic and financial uncertainty, but also with an extremely elevated level of policy uncertainty. This is a background where spikes in volatility might become more frequent. So moving on to the spirit of the conference, which is bringing finance to macro, a lot of prominent economists have been very vocal lately talking about debt and how we shouldn't fear debt and we should feel more comfortable running up uh, deficits. Um, Although whenever they talk, they seem to be referencing macro models that traditionally haven't incorporated the insights from the fixed income literature, like yeah. a lot of insights from yeah. your research. What do you make of these arguments and what do you think they're missing? Well, um, debt has to be used responsibly. Mm -hmm. uh, debt is uh, very useful. Uh, it can be used in a countercyclical fashion uh, when there's an economic slowdown, uh, countercyclical spending. Uh, through debt financing can smooth the economic downturn and in booms buffers can be built so that fiscal capacity for any future downturn can be built up. Mm -hmm. So this kind of cyclical usage of debt is very useful. Uh, debt has also proven very useful in terms of economic development, mm -hmm. right? Indebting a country 
can help to fuel economic growth. And um, for example, uh, China has been a country that has grown incredibly fast over more than two decades. And uh, this was associated with a fairly sizable uh, build-up in debt. Most of that is private sector mm -hmm. debt, so public debt hasn't built up that much. But of course, recently we see around the world that sovereign debt is building up. Now, there is this question of what is a sustainable level of sovereign debt. And of course, with a, with a, with a fall in interest rates, higher debt has become more sustainable from a flow perspective, right? Because in the budget, of course, what matters are the flows. And when interest rates are lower, you can sustain a higher debt burden with a, with a, with a you know, because even though leverage is higher, uh, because interest rates are now lower. So the question now is, are interest rates going to stay low? And uh, factors that economists typically point to are the aging of the population, and in many countries, the shrinkage of the labor force over time. So this tends to push down interest rates. We also see a slowdown of productivity in a number of countries. So it might be that interest rates might be lower in the long run, but of course, uh, that, that is sustaining higher leverage, <coughs> well, higher, higher sovereign debt, but it might also create new risks. So at some point, we might see an increase in risk premium in some countries. Does the stock of debt feature in risk premia? Yes, absolutely. Um, and you can see that in particular in countries in distress. Mm -hmm. So the fund is lending to many countries that have fiscal sustainability problems. And in those countries, you tend to see that the fiscal, once fiscal, the fiscal position becomes unsustainable, uh, risk premiums widen uh, dramatically. Do you think countries like the US have to worry about that? The U.S. is probably uh, removed from its uh, from hitting uh, limits to mm -hmm. its debt capacity, and because interest rates are now in equilibrium now because of these uh, demographic factors and perhaps productivity factors, uh, that might sustain a slightly higher level of debt in the long run. But still, uh, one has to be very careful about the risks that high debt are, are, are causing. So in that, riffing off that a little bit more, it feels like I get the sense from this conference and others that you know finance is making its way into a lot of macro research, right. but it doesn't seem to be making its way in a lot of macro policy debates. Yeah. What do you think is missing from financial literature that they should be aware of? So I think the key to macrofinance is to understand that the buildup of vulnerabilities in good times, so leverage, maturity transformation, and currency mismatches, those are all things that tend to be pro-cyclical, and those make the economy going forward vulnerable. So when leverage is building up, either in the financial sector, in the household sector, in the corporate sector, or in the sovereign sector, this tends to happen in good times, and that uh, exposes the economy to adverse shocks. There are many adverse shocks that can realize, but high vulnerabilities during good times make the economies more vulnerable. Hence, building buffers, building buffers in terms of fiscal capacity, in terms of capital, and in terms of liquidity in all different sectors is key to financial stability and is key to mitigate macro financial linkages in bad times. Is there anything else you think we should talk about? Well, uh, what I have become very interested in is uh, to understand the conditional downside risk. So downside risks to growth going forward as a function of financial variables. Mm -hmm. And it turns out that empirically, financial variables contain a lot of information about downside risks to growth. So monitoring that from a policy perspective is something that excites me a great deal. Which financial variables? So financial conditions are extremely important indicators for downside risk. Mm -hmm. So these are things like credit spreads, term spreads, but also market volatility. Um, and then coupled with financial vulnerabilities, so the level of debt, maturity transformation, currency mismatches. So it's basically 
the interaction between the financial conditions and the financial vulnerabilities that pins down how much downside risk is if adverse shocks occur.